Hello, welcome to the Monday, September 25th, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Baltimore, Maryland. When you're doing forensics on a file system, the most volatile property of the files is probably the access time. It's updated whenever you access the file, meaning whenever you read the file. Now, when Jim recently wrote about the tool MacRobber that he rewrote in Python, he also noted that this tool was not going to collect uh, checksums of these files by default because that again would change the access time. Now, in today's diary, Jim wrote about a little trick that he's using in order to prevent that from happening, and that is to actually use a bind mount. A bind mount really maps one directory in another location and by doing so with the read-only attribute if you are accessing the file in that new location that you mapped it to then access times are not updated. So this is a pretty neat trick but still be careful whenever you access files that you do it correctly and that you are not inadvertently updating your access times. PGP, pretty good privacy, is still probably the dominant encryption mechanism when you're trying to exchange email, in particular for vulnerability disclosure. The advantage of PGP is it's implemented on many platforms as a standalone application. So it's pretty easy to encrypt a file and then attach the encrypted file to an email or to upload it to a website. Well, to facilitate these exchanges, many companies are publishing PGP keys. Now, the emphasis here should be on publishing your public PGP key. Adobe apparently made a mistake late last week and published its private key instead. Sadly, this mistake is more common than it should be. A lot of people who use PGP don't use it regularly and aren't really all that familiar with the mechanics of actually how these keys work. And well, Adobe is just the latest high profile example to fall in this trap. And Avast published an interesting plot post with some additional details about the CCleaner incident. With the help of law enforcement, Avast was able to get a hold of the server used to control the bots that were infected with a CCleaner. But to their surprise, they only found four days worth of logs. Apparently what happened was that there were so many logs flooding the server, it filled up the disk. Whoever was in control of the server actually tried to log on and delete some logs from the server, but still ended up with a corrupt database, which then didn't collect any additional data. This overall looks a little bit like that whoever was behind this attack uh, wasn't necessarily ready sort of for the flood of data they were going to receive. And uh, maybe they actually ran into uh, this particular opportunity without actually having been able first to set up the necessary infrastructure in order to collect the data. A more sophisticated adversary probably would have had an already prepared infrastructure to use in order to take care of this problem. Mobile keyboard apps have had a spotty privacy record in the past. Many of these applications do need to report keystrokes back to a central server in order to, for example, do predict predictive typing where they have to look up in a database what's a likely completion of what you're typing or to do things like spell checking. Now, some of the more reputable apps, they include all of these features in the app itself, but then there are other applications that go to the cloud for it. Well, uh, the Go keyboard for Android actually goes well beyond that. The application actually does promise to not record any data back to the server. But in addition to data that may actually be necessary for the app to function, it also reports back things like the Google account email of the user, language set, which may be necessary in some cases, but also the MC, the location, network type, screen size, and a number of other user profiling type of data points. 
Now this particular mobile keyboard is very popular with over 500 million downloads. There are two versions of it available in Google's Play Store. And apparently these versions are still up for download. This does not look like another case of someone taking an established application and publishing a malicious version of it, but this more looks like intentional but malicious functionality added by the company producing Go Keyboard. Well, and uh, as I said in the beginning, I'm in Baltimore this week. Today on Monday, I'll actually be giving a talk here at the conference about the Internet of Evil Things. If you haven't heard the talk yet, if you are interested, drop me an email. Don't just show up if you're not registered for the conference, but we typically do have some open spots. So just drop me an email and uh, I'll let you know if uh, you can attend or not. That's it for today. Thanks again for listening. And and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.